refueling mission, you know, the, it, a lot of it goes into the pre-mission planning. Uh, everybody says, you know, a good mission starts at the briefing table, and that's so true because everything's coordinated with the, the contact time as well as the, uh, the contact point. So you need to know where you're going to be and when you're going to meet up. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. So the briefing table is really the, the essential part of the rendezvous, and that's getting everything straight from the get-go. From there on, you do what you have to. It's an ever-dynamic, changing process. Things pop up. You may have weather in the way. You try to coordinate as much as possible, but you, you stay flexible. We build timing triangles is what we call it in the tanker world, and that just gives us a little bit of flexibility that if we need to go further away to make sure our timing gets right, that's what we do. If sometimes we could be running a little bit behind because the tanker is never late, so we always get there on time. What we do is we can cut the corner and go direct and get there on time. Once we're within range, we're talking to them on the radios. Uh, we're talking to, if we're the tanker for that day, we're talking to them on the radios and letting them know what, that we're at the orbit and we're ready for them and making sure they're on time. If we need to, we can conserve some gas. We can slow down, change our configuration there to make sure everything, have as much gas as possible. Once they come in, they're, uh, they're coming down a, a direct line straight at us. We have a turn range and offset, and this is based on a point parallel rendezvous. We basically will roll out in front of them, and a lot of times we lead the turn about 25 miles before we start our left-hand turn, and ideally they're going to roll out three miles behind the tanker, and from then on it's just a visual maneuver, and they're going to come up and fly in a formation just to come up and get some gas. And that's pretty much the rendezvous procedure, and most of the time it works out great. Sometimes you got to adjust even the rendezvous. You need to speed up. Maybe we turned late, or they're coming down quick and fast, running low on gas, and we try to expedite. Aero TV is brought to you by Cirrus aircraft have always been easy to fly. Now they're easier than ever to buy. A complete line of ownership programs gives you everything you need to purchase, trade, finance, lease, insure, and warranty your Cirrus. There's even an ownership program for non-pilots. The Cirrus Access Pilot can teach you how to fly or fly the plane for you. Find out more at www.cirrusdesign.com. Cirrus, for the love of flying. Everything works well if you have good crew members that do their job and know their job. Um, and everybody knows their job and they're all professionals, but it's getting everybody coordinated together and you're kind of the, uh, the linchpin as the aircraft commander uh, to make sure everybody's uh, got all the cogs in the wheel are grinding together. Again, like Dennis said, you know, pre-flight planning uh, accomplishes a lot of that so that we all know the same page of music, we're all running off the same thing. Um, you know, rendezvous are complicated, but once you rendezvous with your receiver, the dangerous part hasn't even begun. I mean, flying uh, another aircraft 10 feet from each other in a passing gas at 30,000 feet at 500 miles an hour, it can be kind of sketchy sometimes, so that's the dangerous part. So it's maintaining your situational awareness around you and what's going on with the new receivers. And, you know, we have four different radios at one time we're listening to and trying to balance out who's doing what and where so we know what's down range of us in case we have to plan on, hey, we heard some airliners talking about weather heads and we need to start looking at moving, moving left, of course, or right, of course, or climbing or descending to get out of these clouds or we find some icing or, you know, so there's, there's lots of variables to, uh, to it, but it, again, the rendezvous, is, it, that's the easy part. It's the actual um, putting the two planes 10 feet from each other. That's, that's the sketchy part. Dan can probably agree with me on this, but being an instructor pilot in the KC-10 and flying with the new guys, they don't know what they're doing just yet. And it's by no fault of their own, but it's just you learn by taking time and experience. And uh, flying with new guys, whether it be a, a new aircraft commander that you're trying to teach how for him how to handle everything on his own, Sometimes you have to take a step back. You know how you would handle it. You have to let him flail a little bit and kind of fish his way through it. Uh, for the other guys, you know, the new co-pilots that are coming in straight out of UPT, they're coming off a T1, a small airplane, and once they hear, trying to listen on four radios during a rendezvous, you can just see sometimes the smoke's coming out of their ears and it's a helmet fire. But that can be a challenge, but for the most part, we, have, we hire extremely talented guys. They have a lot of time and they, we hire them for a reason and they have great qualities to be an aircraft commander. And at some point, the, the light bulb goes on and they go, oh, I see how this goes. We have some outstanding co-pilots and aircraft commanders in the, in the reserves. And, and in, in the KC-10 community, I'd say we have some of the best pilots. Aero TV is brought to you by... From the mountains... To the prairies.
to the landings that we love. Garmin SVT, synthetic vision technology. Describing how to fly the uh, KC-10 for those who haven't, I would say it's just, it's really surreal and it is just a big airplane and you forget how big it is. And you don't get the ground rush in the KC-10 like you do in a 172. So it's a very mechanical airplane and it's a very audible. You're listening, we have the call out system that calls down off the radio altimeter and you listen for things. You take a wag and you say, I'm weighing 400,000 pounds, so I'm going to flare maybe a 10% of my gross weight, so 40 feet. And from then, you know, you, you change it up a little bit, but a lot of it's feel uh, from that after doing it so many times. You go, I think this will work today. I'll give that a shot. And sometimes you get lucky and you get that cush landing. Other times you're upsetting the folks in the back and spilling the general's coffee. Everything about this job is amazing. I mean, uh, I start, every time I walk up to the airplane when we get off the crew bus, I have to step back and stare at it. It's just it's such a monstrous airplane, and we're such a tiny little piece in the front of the airplane, but we control that whole back end. We do uh, receiver air refueling as well. This tanker can be refueled by another tanker. So uh, I just uh, picture that in the back of my mind, two DC-10s, 12 feet from each other, all moving to 500 knots at 20,000 feet. How many other people would die to do that? So I have to sit back and really think about that. And uh, in terms of uh, how nervous you get, uh, landing is landing. It's, it's going to stop one way or the other. You know, it's either, the ground's going to stop you. But uh, you know, your momentum carrying you towards another airplane, and you're you're watching the boom go by the window at 20 feet, and you can see this big nozzle go by the windscreen, and you can hear the wind rush just before it makes contact. You can hear the pitch change of the air rush around it, and it's make this high pitch noise. And, uh, you get this little, uh, I don't know, the hair on my neck stands up right before we make contact and you hear the clunk when it goes in and you're just like, I just accomplished something that's pretty amazing. Uh, to me, that's the most exciting part of uh, air feeling.